Ridge Products presents the United States at War, narrated by George C. Scott. This is the Korean War. On June 24, 1950, American Secretary of State Dean Acheson telephoned President Harry Truman, who was visiting his home in Independence, Missouri. Mr. President, he said, I have very serious news. The North Koreans have invaded South Korea. Truman cut short his visit and flew back to Washington, determined to stop the communist threat. Truman later recalled, I remembered how each time the democracies failed to act, it had encouraged the aggressors to keep going ahead. Communism was acting in Korea just as Hitler, Mussolini, and the Japanese had acted 10, 15, and 20 years ago. If this was allowed to go unchallenged, it would mean a third world war, just as similar incidents had brought on the second world war. On June 27th, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution calling on member nations to assist South Korea. That same morning, Truman met with key congressional leaders. Thus, at the beginning of July 1950, the American people, still traumatized from World War II, found themselves contemplating war in Korea. Soon, America would be at war in a country so peripheral to her traditional interests that when the topic of Korea had arisen in 1945, Secretary of State Edward Stettinius had to resort to a map to find it. It has been said that World War II was the continuation of World War I. It was an attempt to resolve conflicts that the First World War had caused or aggravated. Similarly, the Cold War was the continuation of World War II. It was an attempt to balance the power which had been thrown so badly out of alignment by the Second World War. The seeds of both World War II and the Cold War had been planted within the Versailles Treaty, which officially ended World War I. In 1922, R.F. Pettigrew, a former senator from South Dakota, had noted, The Treaty of Versailles is merely an armistice, a suspension of hostilities, while the combatants get their wind. There is a war in every chapter of the treaty, and in every section of the League Covenant. War all over the world. War without end, so long as the conditions endure which produce these documents. The smashing defeat of the Axis powers during World War II led to a bipolar world, a world in which influence tended to be divided between the United States and Russia. The British were exhausted by two world wars. Germany and Japan lay in ruins. The Allied insistence on unconditional surrender from the Axis powers had removed most major barriers to Soviet expansion in Eastern Europe, where Germany had previously dominated. In short order, the Soviet Union regained most of the territory Russia had lost during World War I. She now seemed poised to seize even more. Meanwhile, the United States was secure in its sole possession of the atomic bomb. Its new president, Harry S. Truman, was developing an active policy to limit, contain, and even reduce the area of Soviet control. In their post-war disillusionment, American leaders began to view the Soviets as totalitarians, much the same way as they viewed the defeated Nazis and other fascists. The Soviet Union was both a denial of American ideals and a threat to American commerce in the Pacific. Moreover, the West held the Soviets responsible for virtually all revolutionary movements around the globe. For their part, the Soviets were determined to tighten their grip on recently acquired territory. To them, it was America who posed the global threat. Soviet spokesman Andrei Zhdanov predicted in 1947, Just as in the past, the Munich policy untied the hands of the Nazi aggressors, so today, concessions to the new course of the United States in the imperialist camp may encourage its inspirers to be even more insolent and aggressive. The American-Soviet split was hardening. The temporary division of Germany into eastern and western zones became permanent. 
On a more general level, Europe itself had been carved up into spheres of influence. In the Far East, the division of Korea at the 38th parallel into a northern Soviet zone and a southern American zone threatened to become permanent as well. Winston Churchill, no longer Prime Minister of Britain, sounded the alarm in 1946. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. In front of the Iron Curtain are other causes for anxiety. The future of Italy hangs in the balance. The outlook is also anxious in the Far East and especially in Manchuria. Few stopped to notice that the Soviets consolidated their power differently in each country. In Poland, many times an invasion route into Russia, they saw to it that friendly local communists predominated. Elsewhere, they dealt with broader coalition governments. Of course, opposition to these governments was summarily crushed. Spheres of influence were not a new idea under the sun. Statesmen from Winston Churchill to the American Henry Wallace had called for just such arrangements nor did the creation of spheres of influence cause universal alarm. Even after the brutal Soviet conquest of Czechoslovakia in 1948, Senator Robert Taft remarked, I know of no indication of Russian intention to undertake military aggression beyond the sphere of influence which was originally assigned to them. The situation in Czechoslovakia was indeed a tragic one. But the Russian influence has predominated there since the end of the war. To Taft, the Soviets were consolidating their existing empire, not launching a program of world conquest. Most American leaders did not share this view. They saw Soviet control of Eastern Europe and revolution in Asia as a single problem. They insisted that both were part of a Soviet design for world conquest. America responded to the Soviet threat by creating new government agencies, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Council, and the Atomic Energy Commission. America assumed the role of global policemen on guard against revolution and disorder. The boundary between the West and the Soviets, the Iron Curtain as Churchill called it, was hardening into the Cold War. The Cold War may be defined as a state of constant mobilization of wartime measures in the absence of an actual war. These wartime measures include conscription, huge defense expenditures, inflation, and high taxation. World War II had ushered in the Cold War. World War II had destabilized society, especially in those countries where the commercial classes had been tainted by a wartime collaboration with the Axis powers. Resistance movements from Greece to Vietnam rallied under the banner of nationalism and reform. In early 1947, civil war broke out in Greece. Years earlier, in 1944, Britain had intervened in Greece to prevent a left-wing revolution. But Britain now was exhausted by war and could no longer bear the costs of intervention. Instead, she suggested that the United States get involved. Truman accepted the suggestion. After all, it was widely assumed that the Greek Civil War was a Soviet thrust into Europe. The Americans had already successfully pressured the Soviets into withdrawing from Iran, and a pro-Western government in Greece, as in Iran, was necessary for American and British control of Middle Eastern oil resources. Addressing a special joint session of Congress on March 12, 1947, Truman painted a grim picture of the red tide of expansion throughout the world. The gravity of the situation which confronts the world today necessitates my appearance before a joint session of Congress. The foreign policy and the national security of this country are involved. One aspect of the present situation concerns Greece. The very existence of the Greek state is today threatened by the terrorist activities of several thousand armed men led by communists. The Greek government is unable to cope with the situation. 
Greece must have assistance if it is to become a self-supporting and self-respecting democracy. The United States must supply this assistance. The civil war in Greece offered Truman an opportunity to put teeth into his get-tough policy towards Soviet Russia. But Congress posed a problem. Democratic President Truman faced a strong Republican opposition who wanted to severely curtail government spending. In addition, with World War II at an end, non-interventionist sentiment had re-emerged. Although Congress accepted that America should assume world leadership, some wanted this role to be minimal. Many, like Senator Taft, still hoped that the United Nations and international law could prevent another outburst of war. Truman was advised that to gain congressional support for an expensive and ambitious foreign policy, he had to scare the hell out of the American people. Thus, in his congressional address of March 12, 1947, Truman declared that Turkey, as well as Greece, required assistance. He announced a general philosophy for American foreign policy, which is now called the Truman Doctrine. I am fully aware of the broad implications involved if the United States extends assistance to Greece and Turkey. And I shall discuss these implications with you at this time. One of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and the other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. This was a fundamental issue in the war with Germany and Japan. At the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority, forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies on terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. Truman then requested funding for his philosophy. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. I therefore ask the Congress to provide authority for assistance to Greece and Turkey in the amount of $400 million for the period ending June 30th, 1948. Truman also requested the authority to send over United States military and civilian advisors to supervise American efforts. Opinion makers, liberal and conservative alike, rushed to endorse the containment of communism. But Truman's proposal still met with some congressional opposition. Congressman Howard Buffett of Nebraska prophetically warned. After we have spread ourselves in Greece and Turkey, and our leaders are patting themselves on the back for their successful firm stand, a new alarm will come in. Communistic outbreaks will be reported in another area. We will rush to that alarm. A billion dollar call will come from Korea. There will be renewed demands from China. All over the world, we would soon be answering alarms like an international fireman, maintaining garrisons and pouring out our resources. Our position would become more overextended than Hitler's was at the height of his conquests. Buffett pointed to what he thought were larger issues. Even if it were desirable, America is not strong enough to police the world by military force. 
If that attempt is made, the blessings of liberty will be replaced by coercion and tyranny at home. Our Christian ideals cannot be exported to other lands by dollars and guns. We cannot practice might and force abroad and retain freedom at home. We cannot talk world cooperation and practice power politics. Most Americans disagreed with Buffett and the Greek-Turkish aid bill passed easily. Congress and the public endorsed Truman's call for a system of world alliances and for America's global involvement. Eventually, however, the sheer expense of containment, combined with its meager success, would make Harry S. Truman a very unpopular president. From March 1947, when Truman announced his doctrine until June 1950, when war broke out in Korea, the Cold War accelerated. As intervention grew, so did its theoretical justification. In the influential periodical Foreign Affairs, the American diplomat George Kennan, writing under the pseudonym of X, further defined containment. This was the Truman Doctrine as theory. Kennan wrote that the nature of the Soviet system required expansion. In these circumstances, it is clear that the main element of any United States policy toward the Soviet Union must be that of a long-term, patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. The Soviet pressure against the free institutions of the Western world is something that can be contained by the adroit and vigilant application of counterforce at a series of constantly shifting geographical and political points corresponding to the shifts and maneuvers of Soviet policy but which cannot be charmed or talked out of existence. In June 1947, the administration unveiled a plan of economic assistance to rebuild war-torn Europe. It was named the Marshall Plan after America's World War II General George Marshall. But Europe was already being rebuilt along political lines. In America, the Vandenberg Resolution had sped through Congress. This resolution was aimed at rearming Europe against the Soviets. In response, the Soviets blockaded Berlin, a city entirely surrounded by Soviet-dominated East Germany. Only a huge American and British airlift saved Berlin from starvation. Unrest was spreading around the globe. 1948 witnessed several upheavals. Revolution swept China. North Korea, backed by the Soviets, proclaimed the Korean Democratic People's Republic. Czechoslovakia suppressed its non-communist voices and Yugoslavia split from Soviet control. 1949 was equally tumultuous. Communist forces entered Peking, now known as Beijing. In April, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, was established. Critics of NATO predicted that America would shoulder most of the cost of rearming Europe. Advocates pointed to NATO as America's first line of defense. Under NATO, American troops became permanently stationed in Europe. In May 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, was established. It quickly became the military centerpiece of NATO. In July came news. Russia had tested its first atomic bomb. America's nuclear monopoly was over. American leaders rushed ahead with plans for a super bomb, the thermonuclear or hydrogen bomb. Then, in October, the world was shaken to its roots. A new communist government, the People's Republic of China, was proclaimed. In America, the Soviet bomb and the fall of China to communism became subjects of great recrimination. The American public wanted to know who were the traitors who had allowed these unpleasant realities to occur. A hunt for communist subversives was launched, driving many people from civil service, academia, and the media. This phenomenon, called McCarthyism, was much broader than the influence of its namesake, Senator Joseph McCarthy. The hunt for communists within American society was supported by government policies and by much of the intellectual establishment. The emphasis upon containing communism abroad now fueled repression at home. 
American ideals at home and abroad were perceived to be in a life and death struggle with communism. George Kennan reasoned. It would be an exaggeration to say that American behavior unassisted and alone could exercise a power of life and death over the communist movement and bring about the early fall of Soviet power in Russia. But the United States has in its power to increase enormously the strains under which Soviet policy must operate. To force upon the Kremlin a far greater degree of moderation and circumspection than it has had to observe in recent years. And in this way, to promote tendencies which must eventually find their outlet in either the breakup or the gradual mellowing of Soviet power. Here, Kennan supplied a rationale for a permanent state of mobilization, which was neither war nor peace, but a continued global confrontation. In his memoirs, Kennan would regret the military interpretation of his words. What I was talking about when I mentioned the containment of Soviet power was not the containment by military means of a military threat, but the political containment of a political threat. A great deficiency was the failure to distinguish between various geographic areas and to make clear that the containment of which I was speaking was not something that I thought we could necessarily do everywhere successfully or even needed to do everywhere successfully in order to serve the purpose I had in mind. But few writers questioned the basic concept of containment. One who did was the novelist Louis Bromfield. We have chosen to strangle trade with Russia and Red China in an attempt to bring about a steady deterioration of living conditions and a proportionate increase in discontent. Attempting to throttle the internal welfare of Russia and China while at the same time encircling them is a policy of ruin. The dimensions of containment emerged in early 1950 in a secret memorandum drawn up by the National Security Council. This document was called NSC 68 and it presented the Truman Doctrine as a systematic program. It called for an immediate and massive build-up of the American military in order to establish a pro-Western balance of power and to induce a change in the Soviet system. In essence, the goal of NSC 68 was to defend the entire non-communist world. State Department officials estimated that this goal would require $35 billion per year. Both Congress and the American public flinched at such a budget. A major crisis would be needed to justify the President's program. In June 1950, the Korean War erupted and provided a justification. Korea's history lies in its geography. It is a rugged peninsula bounded by China to the north. A mountain range extends north to south from Manchuria down to the eastern coast. It forms a spiny backbone. About the size of Minnesota, Korea has lived in China's shadow for over 2,000 years. Settlers from China established the first organized state within Korea called Chosun in the third century BC. Around 108 BC, the Chinese emperor Han Wu Ti conquered the entire peninsula of Korea. Thus began centuries of direct Chinese rule. Koreans adopted Chinese names, and to be an educated Korean meant being educated in strictly Chinese terms. In 1266 AD, an emissary from the Emperor of China, seeking to open up trade between Korea and Japan, complained to the isolationist Japanese that they did not send an envoy to Korea. His complaint illustrated the role Korea played in the Chinese Empire. Korea is our buffer state in the East, and Japan, being close to Korea, has had contact with China since time immemorial. Yet, there has not been any exchange of envoys to express mutual friendship in the recent past. 
The states of Korea were unified under the Chinese Yi dynasty, which lasted from 1390 to 1910. During this period, Korea withdrew from world affairs, earning the name the Hermit Kingdom. Korea did, however, remain a bridge between China and Japan. This made Korea open to attack by the Japanese. Meanwhile, through 20 or more centuries, the Korean peasant sweated and groaned. The apparent passivity of the Korean people, however, masked their hardiness and martial tendencies. In 1954, the distinguished British historian Arnold Toynbee criticized his initial reaction to Korea some 23 years before. A Western historian who, en route from Pusan to Seoul on the 15th of November 1929, has seen nothing in the Korean peasants, visible from his railway carriage window, except a pathetic submissiveness, mated with a comic unpracticality, had lived to chide himself, 23 years later, for having left out of account, in committing himself to that ill-judged appraisal, the combination of martial prowess and technological resourcefulness through which those ineffective-looking Koreans' indomitable forebears had once countered and defeated a Japanese assault upon their country in the Korean-Japanese War of A.D. 1592 to 1598. In the second half of the 19th century, Western powers rushed into Asia to carve up the decrepit Manchu Empire. China was forced to concede certain privileges to foreign nationals, missionaries, and business interests. Japan noted this. She began to covet Korea. In 1894, Japan went to war with China. To the surprise of Western observers, Japan won easily. China ceded Formosa to Japan and recognized the independence of Korea. With China out of the picture, the Japanese agreed to share influence in Korea with Russia. The dividing line of this shared influence was the 38th parallel, the boundary which would later separate North and South Korea. But Japan and Russia were quickly at war with each other. After soundly defeating the Russians, Japan formally annexed all of Korea in 1910. Henceforth, the future of Korea would be tied to Japan. When Japan went to war with China in the late 1930s, Korea served as a staging area for Japanese campaigns into Manchuria. Until 1945, Japan exploited Korea as a source of manpower and materials in its struggle with China and with the West. But Asian countries, such as India and Vietnam, were experiencing a groundswell of nationalism. Murmurs of discontent could be heard throughout Asia. As Korean nationalism grew, some Koreans fought with the Chinese communists against the Japanese. Others served with the Russians. Meanwhile in America, a conservative Korean government in exile formed around the aging Korean statesman Syngman Rhee. Rhee had spent many years in exile in the United States where he had sought in vain to interest America in Korea's plight. But World War II created an audience for Rhee. As World War II raged, it became clear that the Allies would win. The disposition of the Japanese Empire now became a matter of some urgency. At the Cairo Conference of November 1943, Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill declared in a joint statement, The three great powers, mindful of the enslavement of the people of Korea, are determined that, in due course, Korea shall become free and independent. In early August 1945, with Russia finally entering the Pacific War and with Japanese surrender at hand, a colonel on the staff of General Marshall noticed something. This colonel, Dean Rusk, who later became Secretary of State, noticed that American troops were nowhere near Korea, even though several Soviet divisions were racing toward the Korean Peninsula. America avidly wished to prevent the Soviets from participating in the occupation of post-war Japan. For this reason, the Russians were asked to stop their advance into Korea at the 38th parallel. The Russians complied. Thus, Korea was liberated from Japan, but divided into two temporary zones divided at the 38th parallel. The American zone was to the south, and the Russian zone was to the north. Korea was quickly being drawn into the vortex of the Pacific Cold War. 
on September 8, 1945. When American occupation forces arrived in South Korea, they found a nationalist and somewhat leftist government. Preferring to work with Syngman Rhee, the Americans suppressed the existing government. Rhee, already an old man, may have been cantankerous, stubborn and autocratic, but he was right-wing. Like his counterpart in North Korea, Kim Il-sung, Rhee was determined to unify Korea in his way. All those who were not solidly behind him were considered to be traitors or communists or both. John Muccio, the American ambassador to Seoul, described Rhee. Rhee had fought in what really amounted to a guerrilla operation so long that when he finally ended up as the president of Korea, he was so old that he could not change from his revolutionary instincts to being a duly recognized head of state. To the north, the Soviet-backed communists proceeded to break down the old order. In February 1948, the Korean Democratic People's Republic was proclaimed. With Soviet assistance, they built up an impressive army and tank corps. America moved more slowly in South Korea because American leaders did not entirely trust Syngman Rhee. Rhee seemed bent on invading the North, whereas the United States wanted South Korea to be only strong enough to defend itself. Then, with the power in Korea balanced, American forces could withdraw to other areas where they were needed. After all, America's main concern in the Pacific was Japan, who was to be the linchpin of an American-dominated Asia. The triumph of the communists in China complicated politics in the Pacific. During World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt had hoped that American pressure could bring about a pro-American regime. But as the civil war in China deepened, Americans washed their hands of the situation rather than commit ground forces. The State Department issued a famous white paper to explain American policy. The white paper declared, It has been urged that relatively small amounts of additional aid, military and economic, to the national government would have enabled it to destroy communism in China. The most trustworthy military, economic, and political information available to our government does not bear out this view. The only alternative open to the United States was full-scale intervention on the behalf of a government which had lost the confidence of its own troops and its own people. The unfortunate but inescapable fact is that the ominous result of the civil war in China was beyond the control of the government of the United States. This was not what those who favored intervention, known as the China lobby, wanted to hear. Cries of, who lost China, resounded through the halls of Congress. Congressmen demanded an American commitment to the overthrown leader Chiang Kai-shek, who was now in Taiwan. Some even talked about retaking the Chinese mainland. The Truman administration saw the establishment of communism in China as evidence of Soviet expansion. In 1949, when the Chinese demanded a seat at the United Nations, the United States successfully blocked them. But even now, Korea was not an American priority. In January 1950, Secretary of State Dean Acheson defined America's Pacific interests. This defensive perimeter runs along the Aleutians to Japan and then goes to the Ryukyus. We hold important defense positions in the Ryukyu Islands and these we will continue to hold. The defensive perimeter runs from the Ryukyus to the Philippines. Later Republicans would charge that by excluding Korea from that perimeter the Democratic Truman administration had allowed the Soviets to think that an invasion of South Korea would not be opposed. To this charge, Acheson would reply, first, he had never implied Korea would not be defended. Second, the Joint Chiefs and General Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander Allied Powers in Japan, had approved this perimeter. Within the divided nation of Korea, relations between the North and South were deteriorating. Relations between Rhee and his South Korean political opponents were also going from bad to worse. The Korean people wanted a unified country. The question became, which government would bring it about? In January 1948, a United Nations Commission visited Korea to propose elections to unify the country.
The United States pushed through a demand that the elections occur in a part of Korea that was accessible to the UN observers, that is, in South Korea. The elections never took place. Thus, 1948 saw two rival governments, each claiming legitimate authority over all of Korea. By the end of 1948, Soviet troops had withdrawn from the North. Americans were making similar plans for a phased withdrawal from the South. Each Korea now began a fierce campaign to undermine the other. Guerrillas crossed the 38th parallel in both directions. Each side rallied local discontent under its banner. In South Korea, rebellion broke out on the island of Jeju-do, led by the South Korean Labor Party. But the rebellion was regional, and after several months of vigorous effort, Ri's army crushed it. 40,000 people died in the Jeju-do rebellion and its aftermath. Far worse, from the American point of view, Ri began to openly call for an invasion of the North to unify Korea. The South Korean defense minister complained of being held back by the United States. If we had our own way, we would, I'm sure, have started up already. But we had to wait until the Americans are ready. They keep telling us, no, 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 wait, you are not ready. Neither of the two Koreas recognized the 38th parallel as a legitimate boundary, and border incidents multiplied. Entire battalions crossed the line to fight each other. In August, clashes were especially heavy. One American general offered an explanation of these confrontations. Each was, in our opinion, brought on by the presence of a small South Korean salient north of the parallel. The South Koreans wish to invade the North. We tell them that if such occurs, all advisors will pull out and the Economic Cooperation Administration spigot will be turned off. Most incidents on the parallel are due to needling by opposing local forces. Both North and South are at fault. No attacks by the North have ever been in serious proportions. Perhaps northern incursions were light because the North hoped for a southern revolt against Ri. By June 1949, opponents of Ri had formed the Democratic Front for Unification of the Fatherland, an umbrella organization which pushed for a left-wing revolution. Why invade South Korea if a revolution could accomplish the same goal? In the winter of 1949, however, the South Korean government cracked down on insurgents. In districts considered to be disloyal, Ri's army herded peasants into small hamlets to separate them from the guerrillas. Thus it was believed the guerrillas could be separated from their support. Opposition leaders, including members of the South Korean National Assembly, were arrested. Tens of thousands of South Koreans became political prisoners. Despite Ri's staunch efforts to contain his opposition, he suffered a major defeat in the 1950 elections. Ri again began to look north across the parallel. A full-scale conflict might well solidify his political position. By the summer of 1950, the two Koreas were poised for war. On Sunday morning, June 25, 1950, North Korean soldiers, backed by Soviet-built tanks, suddenly poured across the length of the 38th parallel. With amazing speed, the South Korean army crumbled. Syngman Rhee panicked and fled the capital of Seoul, even before the American ambassador John J. Muccio had packed. Muccio would later remind Rhee of this fact when Rhee became difficult to work with. The Truman administration was shocked. The last American forces had already been withdrawn from Korea, even though reports of a major military buildup had leaked out of North Korea for months, the CIA and military intelligence had failed to anticipate this lunge across the parallel. Some historians point out that great quantities of Soviet supplies continued arriving in North Korea into the fall. This suggests that Kim Il-sung's government originally intended to go to war as late as the end of August. Why then did they attack in June? North Korean sources sometimes claim that the attack was a response to a South Korean incursion. But earlier incursions had not provoked such a response. Why was June different? Until North and South Korea open their archives, the answer will remain unclear. But one thing is apparent. 
after several years of external and internal operations by both sides, North Korea attacked with a fully mobilized army. In those first confused hours in Washington and in Tokyo, the seat of American military operations in the Pacific, everyone assumed one thing. The Soviets were responsible. The United States was convinced that North Korea was merely executing Stalin's orders. Actually, there is reason to doubt this. If the Soviets had orchestrated the attack, it is difficult to explain why their representative was at the same moment boycotting the UN Security Council. His absence made possible the fateful UN resolution which named North Korea as the aggressor. Moreover, the North Korean leader, Kim Il-sung, was a fervent nationalist as well as a communist. He seemed able to start a war all by himself. In the March 1951 issue of Current History, an American observer explained, Stalin may have loaded the gun, but it was Kim Il-sung who seized upon it and pulled the trigger. With complete disregard for Stalin's chips in the bigger game, Kim took advantage of a favorable set of local circumstances. Koreans are but neophytes in the game of politics, either domestic or international. South Koreans have demonstrated that impulsiveness frequently outweighs their political expediency. Politicians in the North need not be unaffected by the same trait. One explanation of the invasion claims that the North was responding to Rhee's increasingly aggressive rhetoric. Rhee had written to his chief advisor less than two weeks before the invasion. I think now is the best time for us to take on the offensive to mop up the guerrillas. We will drive Kim Il-sung and his bandits to remote mountains and make them starve there in order to make the Duman and Yalu rivers our defense line. Our people are desiring for an action against the North. And Koreans in the North are also fervently looking forward to our action. Perhaps the North chose to act on its own initiative before Ri could finish a military build-up. In his memoirs, former Russian Premier Nikita Khrushchev supported this view. I must stress that the war wasn't Stalin's idea, but Kim Il-sung's. Kim was the initiator. Stalin, of course, didn't try to dissuade him. In my opinion, no real communist would have tried to dissuade Kim Il-sung from his compelling desire to liberate South Korea from Sing Won Ri and from reactionary American influence. To have done so would have contradicted the communist view of the world. Mao Zedong also approved Kim Il-sung's suggestion and put forward the opinion that the USA would not intervene since the war would be an internal matter which the Korean people would decide for themselves. Khrushchev indicated that Stalin had been less than pleased by Kim's initiative. It's absolutely incomprehensible to me why he did it. But when Kim Il-sung was preparing for his march, Stalin called back all our advisors who were with the North Korean divisions and regiments, as well as all the advisors who were serving as consultants and helping to build up the army. I asked Stalin about this, and he snapped back at me. It's too dangerous to keep our advisors there. They might be taken prisoner. We don't want there to be evidence for accusing us of taking part in this business. It's Kim Il-sung's affair. American leaders blamed the Soviets and placed the Korean conflict firmly within the foreign policy framework of containment. Although no one thought Korea had much strategic importance, it suddenly became a psychological domino. As General Omar Bradley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, put it, we must draw the line somewhere. The line now seemed to be drawn at Korea. From Truman on down, American leaders called for a strong response. Inaction, they said, would send the communists the wrong message. In addition, America considered the markets of Indochina and South Korea to be essential to the recovery of Japan, and Japan was the key to United States policy in Asia. On June 25, 1950, the same day as North Korea's attack, 
Truman rushed the issue of Korea to a rapidly convened UN Security Council. Later that day, the UN demanded an immediate cessation of hostilities and asked the North Koreans to withdraw to the north of the 38th parallel. Two days later, the UN resolved to provide military assistance to South Korea. President Truman used the UN resolution to justify an American military response. But Congressman Howard Buffett later pointed out chronological discrepancies which undermined Truman's justification. Here are the facts. On June 25, 1950, the UN Security Council demanded a ceasefire and called on members to render every assistance to the United Nations in the execution of this resolution. Nothing was said about entering the conflict. But at 12 o'clock noon on June 27, President Truman ordered United States air and sea units to give the Korean government troops cover and support. That order put our military forces into the Korean Civil War on the side of the South Koreans. At 10.45 that evening, 11 hours later, the Security Council requested members of the UN to supply the Republic of Korea with sufficient military assistance to repel invasion. Was the last resolution of the Security Council rammed through hastily to legalize Truman's military intervention? That, I don't know. But this truth is clear. Truman entered that war by his own act and not because of a United Nations decision. By fighting under the UN flag, the United States gained a legal basis for intervention. This basis was known as collective security. The idea that UN members should go to war in order to prevent aggression and preserve peace. Critics commented that this principle tended to turn local conflicts into international wars. Thus, the Korean conflict became a United Nations war under the direction of the United States. Although American forces predominated, Great Britain, Canada, and Australia also participated. In addition, Greece, Turkey, and Belgium sent small units. Even France spared a few men from Indochina in a show of Western solidarity. The North Korean advance continued. The South Korean capital of Seoul fell, and the North began executing members of the South Korean Assembly. For their part, Rhee's forces had executed some 50,000 political prisoners just before the fall of Seoul. The Western press felt free to report communist atrocities, but they were silent regarding those committed by their Koreans. On June 29th, General MacArthur flew to Korea for an inspection tour of the deteriorating front. MacArthur later recalled, Across the Han, Seoul burned and smoked in its agony of destruction. There was the constant crump of red mortar fire. Below me were the retreating, panting columns of disorganized troops, the drab color of their weaving lines, interspersed here and there with the bright red crosses of ambulances, filled with broken, groaning men. Everywhere were the stench and utter desolation of a stricken battlefield. America faced a major problem. How to get enough American forces into South Korea to maintain a toehold before the communists took over. By August 1st, 1950, the North held all of Korea except the southeastern corner around the port of Busan. This remaining area was roughly 800 square miles in size. U.S. commanders determined to reinforce and hold some 500 square miles of it. Once this area was secured, the Superior American Navy and Air Force would make a breakout. The Korean conflict seemed to justify the Truman Doctrine that America should be a global guardian. Hume Wong, Canadian ambassador to the United States, stated the case broadly. Perhaps the best result 
of the Korean affair is that it has made it possible for the people of the United States to accept the load involved in making their military power equal to their world responsibilities. When President Truman requested an extra $10 billion for defense, Congress gave him $11 billion. The military draft, which was about to expire, was extended. Soon, even the supposedly isolationist Republicans in Congress surpassed the Truman administration in their anti-communism and in their support for military spending. But the Korean War disturbed those who were concerned with constitutional procedure and with the power of Congress to declare war. The fact that Truman had ordered American forces into combat before the Security Council called for such action was no minor point. In his book, A Foreign Policy for Americans, Senator Robert Taft commented, If the President can carry out every recommendation of the Security Council or the General Assembly, then he has almost unlimited power to do anything in the world in the use of either troops or money. The Security Council might recommend that the nation should rebuild the canals on the Tigris and Euphrates and establish a vast Garden of Eden in the Kingdom of Iraq. According to the argument made, the President could send troops to Tibet to resist communist aggression, or to Indochina, or anywhere else in the world without the slightest voice of Congress. Taft concluded, In the case of Korea, where a war was already underway, we had no right to send troops to a nation with whom we had no treaty to defend it against attack by another nation, no matter how unprincipled that aggression might be, unless the whole matter was submitted to Congress and a declaration of war or some other direct authority obtained. But the State Department defended Truman's claim to executive power. Even leading liberals such as columnist Richard H. Rovere agreed. The President of the United States has the right to take whatever action he deems necessary in any area he judges to be related to the defense of this country, regardless of whether it is related to the defense of Formosa or anything else. The stage was set. Future presidents now had a precedent with which to justify involving America in war with little or no input from Congress. On a related issue, however, the Supreme Court rejected Truman's bid for more executive power. In December 1950, the President had declared a state of national emergency. In April 1952, the threat of a national steel strike led Truman to direct the Secretary of Commerce to operate the steel mills. Speaking for the Supreme Court, Justice Jackson announced, No doctrine that the court could promulgate would seem to me more sinister and alarming than that a president whose conduct of foreign affairs is so largely uncontrolled and often even is unknown can vastly enlarge his mastery over the internal affairs of the country by his own commitment of the nation's armed forces to some foreign venture. Dismissing the executive doctrine of broad but undefined war powers, Jackson continued, No penance would ever expiate the sin against free government of holding that a president can escape control of executive powers by law through assuming his military role. The court lectured Truman on the separation of powers and declared his seizure of the steel mills to be invalid. But this was not the only criticism that Truman encountered. From one end of the political spectrum came cries that he was too weak. Another faction preferred involvement in Asia to involvement in Europe. This faction included Republican Senator Huey, who once remarked, with God's help, we will lift Shanghai up and up ever up until it is just like Kansas City. Other critics demanded to know why Truman was pulling his punches in Asia. Why was there no attempt to retake the mainland of China? Why not actively support Chiang Kai-shek? 
These questions became part of a great debate over the nature of American foreign policy. On October 19, 1950, former Republican President Herbert Hoover warned, We must realize, and the world must realize, that 160 million Americans cannot alone maintain the safety of the world against 800 million communists on the fronts of both Europe and Asia. On December 12, 1950, former Ambassador Joseph P. Kennedy, father of future President John F. Kennedy, called for a complete reversal of foreign policy. That policy is suicidal. It has not contained communism. By our methods of opposition, it has solidified communism. Where well, otherwise, communism might have bred within itself internal dissensions. Calling Truman's program bankrupt, Kennedy called for a new direction. Our first step is to get out of Korea. Indeed, to get out of every point in Asia which we do not plan realistically to hold in our own defense. What business is it of ours to support French colonial policy in Indochina? Or to achieve Mr. Syngman Rhee's concepts of democracy in Korea? We can do well to mind our own business and interfere only where somebody threatens our business and our homes. The Liberal magazine, The New Republic, sided with the administration. There is no thought of a compromise with North Korea and China which legalizes successful aggression. If we withdraw, we are faced with Chinese and Soviet regimes ready to take full advantage of their demonstrated military superiority over the West. French Indochina is certain to be the next victim and Japan, completely unarmed, may be threatened. The editors proposed their own foreign policy program. The first step is much greater military mobilization. The next is economic action to back it up and to halt inflation. It means a shift from limited to full control on materials. It means full price and wage controls. It means a much higher rate of taxation. It means a full draft on manpower. These are the initial requirements of peace without appeasement. Who can argue that peace is not worth the price? It was the price tag that concerned Truman's critics. As the war dragged on, Truman became the least popular president in decades. As the election of 1952 approached, Truman announced that he would not seek another term. Early in the war, South Korean President Rhee conceded the gravity of the situation. As he phrased it, we are in a hell of a fix. When the Allied forces were driven farther south into Busan, their commander, General MacArthur, responded to this fix by exceeding his authority. He ordered the bombing of North Korea. Some have called General MacArthur an American Caesar. Certainly, he was a paradoxical figure. The general was an uneven strategist who could follow a brilliant maneuver with an obvious mistake. MacArthur had a long-standing resentment against his superiors in Washington, stemming from World War II, having felt that his command had been overlooked. Now he commanded the Pacific, the theater which he believed was America's destiny. The general's constant quarrel with the president and with the Joint Chiefs stemmed from his differing strategic vision. To fight communism, MacArthur was willing to risk war with China and even Russia. Washington was not. Accordingly, MacArthur regularly evaded or interpreted orders. In September 1950, MacArthur's immediate problem was to break out of the Pusan trap. The Americans there were holding on, but they were not battle-scarred veterans on whom he could rely. Most of them had never seen combat. They had been hastily flown in from Japan and then chased by the North Koreans down the peninsula to Busan. The Pentagon was sending MacArthur all the forces it could, but other outposts, above all Western Europe, had to be maintained. MacArthur needed a flanking maneuver to cut the North Koreans in half. Then American air and sea power could offset the communist manpower advantage. To do this, MacArthur planned what has been called the most brilliant operation of his career. 
he decided to make a massive amphibious landing at the port of Incheon, well up the peninsula. Incheon was close to Seoul, and the liberation of the South Korean capital would have great symbolic value. But above all, such a landing would split the North Koreans and permit a breakout from Busan. Unfortunately, MacArthur made a serious error in his planning. He divided his command. General Edward Allman commanded 10 Corps, the Incheon invasion force. General Walton Walker commanded the beleaguered 8th Army at Busan. Each reported separately to MacArthur. This decision to split the command would later present great problems. Many in MacArthur's command thought the Incheon invasion was suicide. One officer complained, Make up a list of amphibious don'ts and you have an exact description of the Incheon operation. To MacArthur's mind, this was a plus. The communists would never expect it. The Incheon invasion began on September 15, 1950. It was a dazzling success. Massive aerial and naval bombardment softened up the North Korean fortress of Incheon. The damage was so extensive that the pilots ran out of identifiable targets. Marine Colonel Alpha Bowser recalled the effect on the enemy. Many of these people staggered out of bunkers and holes in a total state of shock. If they weren't dead or badly wounded, they were in such a state of shock that they were just staggering around. American Marines were soon ashore, followed by Army units. South Korean Marines garrisoned the ruined city, and the UN forces crossed the 25 miles to Seoul. On September 16th, the American counteroffensive began at Busan. Massive bombing broke the Communist will to hold the perimeter. Instead, the Communists chose to stand at Seoul. The American army wanted to go directly to Seoul, but the Marines preferred to mop up all resistance as they went along. This was the first of many quarrels between commanders. By September 18th, North Korean resistance at Seoul was ebbing. MacArthur made one of his parade-like entries by car and proclaimed the South Korean capital to be liberated. The North Koreans were on the run. General George C. Marshall, the new Secretary of Defense, cabled MacArthur. We want you to feel unhampered, tactically and strategically, to proceed north of the 38th parallel. MacArthur cabled back. Unless and until the enemy capitulates, I regard all Korea as open for our military operations. Giddy with success, American leaders widened the war. This acceleration came in spite of the fact that by forcing the North Koreans past the 38th parallel, the UN resolution had been fulfilled. But American leaders now saw an opportunity to unify the entire Korean peninsula under a pro-Western regime. Re egged them on. United States leaders discounted the possibility of Soviet or Chinese intervention, and MacArthur's split command moved north toward the Yalu River. This was the boundary between North Korea and China. On October 20th, UN forces took Pyongyang, the northern capital. On the 24th, MacArthur took the risky step of allowing non-Korean forces to operate in the provinces bordering China. But the Chinese response was already underway. On October 14th, ten days earlier, Chinese troops had crossed quietly over the Yalu River into North Korea. Some 100,000 lightly equipped Chinese now sat and waited for the UN forces that were running blindly towards them. In an amazing feat, the Chinese had moved their troops under cover of night and strict discipline unnoticed. Not that notice had not been given. India's ambassador to Peking, K. M. Panikar, had attempted to convey China's intentions to the West. On October 2nd, Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai had summoned Panikar in the dead of night. The Indian ambassador passed on the encounter to the United States. He reported, Then he came to the point. If the Americans crossed the 38th parallel, China would be forced to intervene in Korea. Otherwise, he was most anxious for a peaceful settlement. I asked him whether he had already news of the Americans having crossed the borders. He replied in the affirmative, but added that he did not know where they had crossed. I asked him whether China intended to intervene if only the South Koreans crossed the parallel. He was emphatic. The South Koreans did not matter. 
but American intrusion into North Korea would encounter Chinese resistance. American leaders discounted this warning. On October 27th, UN-US forces ran headlong into this mass of Chinese. The Chinese army, together with 80,000 North Koreans, routed the Americans. Casualties on both sides were staggering. The crusade to unify Korea became one of the greatest disasters in United States military history. American troops became a disorganized mob, which retreated south through the killing cold of winter. MacArthur tried to retaliate. He ordered the bombing of bridges and hydroelectric power stations along the Yellow River, which supplied both Korea and Manchuria with electricity. But the Joint Chiefs were adamantly opposed to a land war on the Chinese mainland. They feared Soviet involvement, which would lead to World War III. United States forces, therefore, operated under new restrictions. American planes were not to bomb targets within China. The war would be limited. In late November, MacArthur ordered a counteroffensive against the Communist Chinese in Korea. The Chinese held. Indeed, they launched a second offensive, which forced another UN-US retreat. On December 9th, the Marines of 10th Corps were cut off by the Chinese and attempted to withdraw by sea. But lack of supplies, poor communication, and the cruel Korean winter made the situation on both sides desperate. Soldiers suffered from frostbite and malnutrition. Guns jammed in the sub-zero cold, and soldiers urinated on them to make them work. A Navy surgeon described Frozen Chosen, the reservoir near which American Marines were trapped, to the Chicago Daily News. Everything was frozen. Plasma froze and the bottles broke. We couldn't use plasma because it didn't go into solution and the tubes would clog up with particles. We couldn't change dressings because we had to work with gloves on to keep our hands from freezing. The Chinese fared no better. The commander of the Chinese 26th Army reported, The troops were hungry. They ate cold food. They were unable to maintain the physical strength for combat. The wounded could not be evacuated. The firepower of our entire army was basically inadequate. The new year, 1951, saw the opening of a third communist offensive. The Americans abandoned Seoul, and the battlefield moved south of the 38th parallel. Gradually, the 8th Army fought its way back up to the parallel. From then on, the Korean War would be one of attrition. The stalemated armies would fight back and forth over the same ground. In April 1951, General MacArthur bypassed President Truman by sending a letter to Republican Congressman Joseph Martin. It seems strangely difficult for some to realize that here in Asia is where the communist conspirators have elected to make their play for global conquest and that we have joined the issue thus raised on the battlefield that if we lose the war to communism in Asia, the fall of Europe is inevitable. Win it, and Europe would most probably avoid war and yet preserve freedom. As you point out, we must win. There is no substitute for victory. Congressman Martin read MacArthur's letter on the floor of the House. Once again, the general had publicly questioned the administration and, to their minds, had aided their Republican critics at home. Truman exploded. The son of a bitch isn't going to resign on me. I want him fired. On April 11, 1951, a cable was received by Army Secretary Frank Pace, who had been sent to Korea for the sole purpose of receiving it. The cable read, You will advise General Matthew Ridgway that he is now the Supreme Commander of the Pacific. General MacArthur relieved. You will proceed to Tokyo, where you will assist General Ridgway in assuming his command. Marshal. But MacArthur was a hero to millions of Americans. He returned home to tumultuous crowds and huge parades. He was invited to address a joint session of Congress. Defending his strategic vision, MacArthur explained, I called for reinforcements. 
but was informed that reinforcements were not available. I made clear that if not permitted to destroy the build-up of bases north of the Yalu, if not permitted to utilize the friendly Chinese force of some 600,000 men on Formosa, if not permitted to blockade the China coast to prevent the Chinese Reds from getting succor from without, and if there were to be no hope of major reinforcements, the position of the command from the military standpoint forbade victory. I have constantly called for the new political decisions essential to a solution. Efforts have been made to distort my position. It has been said, in effect, that I am a warmonger. Nothing could be further from the truth. I know war, as few other men now living know it, and nothing to me is more revolting. But once war is forced upon us, there is no alternative than to apply every available means to bring it to a swift end. War's very object is victory, not prolonged indecision. In war, indeed, there can be no substitute for victory. MacArthur was interrupted repeatedly by applause. He continued. The magnificence of the courage and fortitude of the Korean people defies description. They have chosen to risk death rather than slavery. Their last words to me were, Don't scuttle the Pacific. I am closing 52 years of military service. When I joined the army, even before the turn of the century, it was the fulfillment of all my boyish hopes and dreams. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plain at West Point, and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed most proudly that Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballad, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave the light to see that duty. MacArthur did not just fade away. He made more long appearances before congressional committees. His supporters painted the general in glowing colors. The administration supporters asked embarrassing questions about his habit of interpreting orders. After the hearings, MacArthur flirted with the 1952 Republican presidential nomination. But the Republican Party chose his old rival, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, instead, and MacArthur retired from politics. In 1964, from his deathbed, MacArthur would beg President Lyndon B. Johnson not to get bogged down in Vietnam. 
Meanwhile, the Korean War remained an expensive stalemate. The Americans stepped up the air assault, but the administration was beginning to look for a way out. America's allies, especially Great Britain, wanted some kind of truce in Korea. Then perhaps the allies could get on with the more important task of rearming Europe. The Americans faced a dilemma. How could they open peace talks without losing face? After all, the American government had steadfastly refused to recognize the legitimacy of communist China, its main antagonist. How could they negotiate with a state that didn't officially exist? In May 1951, George Kennan, a veteran diplomat respected by the Soviets, had opened private talks with Yakov Malik, the Soviet UN delegate. His goal? A way out of Korea. The Soviets agreed to meet with China and North Korea on behalf of the United States. In late June, the Soviets proposed beginning talks on military issues while excluding a general political settlement. On June 29th, American General Ridgway broadcast a radio appeal to the enemy commanders. I am informed that you may wish a meeting to discuss an armistice providing for the cessation of hostilities and all acts of armed force in Korea with adequate guarantees for the maintenance of such armistice. Ridgway went on to suggest that they could meet on a Danish hospital ship in Wonsan Harbor. On July 2nd came the radio reply. We are authorized to tell you that we agree to suspend military activities and to hold peace negotiations and that our delegates will meet with yours. We suggest, in regard to the place for holding talks, that such talks be held at Kaesong on the 38th parallel. If you agree to this, our delegates will be prepared to meet your delegates between July 10th and 15th, 1951. This joint message was from Kim Il-sung and General Peng Tae-hwai, Chinese commander in Korea. The communists proved to be tough negotiators with many questions. Who would sit where at the peace table? What would be the exact location of truce lines? How would prisoners be exchanged? The talks dragged on and on. Meanwhile, military action resumed and the American public grew impatient. So did Americans in the field, who would fight to capture a point, only to lose it, and then retake it again, all the while hearing about negotiations with the enemy. The major bone of contention in the negotiations was the issue of prisoners of war. The United States insisted that all prisoners under their authority be given the choice of refusing repatriation to their homelands. In this, Americans hoped to gain a propaganda victory when, as expected, thousands of North Koreans and Chinese indicated a desire to stay in South Korea or go to Taiwan. For the communists, this was unacceptable. The UN allies held some 132,000 North Korean and Chinese prisoners. The communists held only 11,559 UN prisoners. Given this unfavorable ratio, the communists made as much of their prisoners as they could. Even after the peace settlement, the issue of POWs loomed large. As the American public searched for explanation for this no-win war, one object of public recrimination became the softness of the American character. The press was filled with accounts of brainwashing and other forms of torture which had been used to make UN prisoners sign dubious confessions of war crimes. Despite this publicity, however, only a small percentage of American prisoners actually had collaborated. In November 1952, the Republican candidate Dwight D. Eisenhower rode a wave of war weariness into the White House. Elected with 55% of the vote, Eisenhower quietly began to pressure the communist bloc. He let it be known that America was seriously contemplating the use of atomic weapons in Korea. Then on March 4, 1953, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin died. A slight thaw in the Cold War followed. In April 1953, Operation Little Switch, a small-scale POW exchange, set the stage for solving the prisoner problem. It was decided that a neutral power, India, would interview and process the prisoners of war. 
although South Korea's President Rhee tried to sabotage this arrangement by allowing some 27,000 POWs to escape, the exchange was successful. Until June 30th, combat continued sporadically. Finally, on July 27th, 1953, a lasting armistice was signed. The 38th parallel became a permanent boundary. Most of Korea lay in ruins. Of the American bombing, General Curtis LeMay remarked, We burned down just about every city in North and South Korea both. We killed off over a million civilian Koreans and drove several million more from their homes. General Emmett O'Donnell added, I would say that the entire, almost the entire Korea Peninsula is just a terrible mess. Everything is destroyed. There's nothing standing worthy of the name. Just before the Chinese came in, we were grounded. There were no more targets in Korea. Despite this scarcity of targets, the bombing had been resumed. One target, the three-mile-square dam near the North Korean capital of Pyongyang. The purpose? To flood and destroy major rice crops. Afterward, the official American history of the war would note the principal reason for so many North Korean refugees was simply starvation. As many as two million Koreans died as a result of the war. Tens of thousands more were murdered by secret police in both the North and South. Korean society was riddled with the vice that war encourages, the black market and prostitution. America's first war without victory was over. American casualties totaled 33,629 dead, 142,091 wounded, and many Americans had been introduced to drugs. More than a decade would pass before other leaders would involve the United States in an East Asian war. In his 1954 work, A New Pattern for a Tired World, Louis Bromfield wrote, We have intervened disastrously and in the long run futilely in Korea. This attempt to dominate and direct the whole course, not only of Asia, but of the world, is a policy of insanity, which can only cause war after war and the eventual ruin of this nation. The future of Asia will be determined not by a few men in Washington on the opposite side of the world, but as it should be, by Asiatics. And if the people of Asia choose to involve themselves in the disastrous experiment of communism, from which it will take them generations to emerge, that is Asia's problem, and not our own. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation of The Korean War by Knowledge Products. The script for this presentation is by Joseph R. Stromberg. Script edited by Wendy McElroy. Produced by Pat Childs. Vocal characterizations are by Song E. Chun, Dan Church, Rob Daniel, Jim Gossett, Travis Hardison, Cecil Jones, Ho Kiel Khan, Joe Keenan, Bill Kolke, Sheldon Ma, Paul Meyer, Norm Woodell, and Robert Wynn. Music is by Ralph Childs, recorded at the Village Recorder and Archer Productions. This material may not be copied in whole or in part without the written permission of the copyright owner. Copyright 1990 by Carmichael and Carmichael Incorporated. This presentation of the Korean War is a part of the Audio Classics series, a continuing series presenting the major ideas of great thinkers with the discussion of their historical and intellectual context. Knowledge Products presents The United States at War, narrated by George C. Scott. This is the Vietnam War, Part 1. On September 2, 1945, a slender figure stood on a balcony in Hanoi and addressed the crowd. All men are created equal.
They are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the peoples on the earth are equal from birth. All the peoples have the right to live to be happy and free. The speaker was Ho Chi Minh, communist leader of North Vietnam. The document being read was the Declaration of Independence of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. American Army officers shared the review stand while a Vietnamese band played the Star Spangled Banner. Later in the day, American warplanes flew in salute over the city. The Americans saluted Ho Chi Minh, who had actively assisted the Allies against the Japanese during World War II. He had organized a resistance movement in Vietnam. One of its tasks had been to rescue U.S. pilots shot down in the jungle. Now, Ho believed that the United States would sponsor Vietnam's independence from her former colonial master, France. On April 30, 1975, only 30 years later, the United States ambassador would flee by helicopter from a besieged Saigon. His departure would end American involvement in the Vietnam War, a conflict during which one president was assassinated, another declined re-election, and a third was discredited. It was a war like no other. World War I was the war for democracy, World War II was the war for peace, but history attaches no phrase to the Vietnam War. Everyone deals with it on personal terms. Vietnam has been described as two rice baskets at the opposite ends of their carrying pole. The carrying pole is a series of mountains running down the length of the S-shaped country. The rice baskets are the rich agricultural regions of the Mekong Delta in the south and the Red River Delta in the north. These deltas have made Vietnam one of the world's leading rice producers. About the size of California, Vietnam lies in the tropical zone. From November to April, the winter monsoon blows from the northeast. Between May and October, the summer monsoon blows from the southwest. It has been said that the Vietnamese have been more affected by monsoons than by the successive presence of the Chinese, the Japanese, the French, and the Americans. As its name suggests, Indochina, of which Vietnam forms the eastern border, lies between India and China, the two great eastern cultures. Much of Indochina's history has been formed by this geography, which has made it an attractive colony. A Vietnamese song, A Mother's Fate, chronicles how Vietnam has been buffeted about. A thousand years of Chinese reign, a hundred years of French domain, twenty years of civil war. I pass to you a mother's fate, a sad Vietnam is a mother's fate. For many centuries, Vietnam was occupied by the Chinese. Then, during the 1840s, the French Navy used the mistreatment of missionaries as a pretext to invade Vietnamese ports. France acquired the southern area of Vietnam, called Cochin, China, as a colony. There, the French imposed their own distinctive theory of colonization, called Mission Civilisatrice, or the Civilizing Mission. France imposed its own version of civilization, which was embodied in the concentration of land ownership, the Catholic religion, Western legal codes, and the introduction of a cash economy, which emphasized the possession of money as opposed to land or goods. In South Vietnam, the French entered a region of landowning peasants. Over a century later, they left a region of landless peasants. The land was reassigned to the French and Europeans, or on occasion, to those Vietnamese loyal to the French. The new legal system destroyed the traditional system of law. For example, the Vietnamese had granted divorce due to sterility, but the French Catholic system frowned upon divorce for any reason. The French attitude toward the dominant Buddhist religion was well captured by the missionary's handbook, Catechism in Eight Days, written by the Jesuit Alexandre de Rhodes for use in Vietnam. Of Buddhism, Rhodes warned, This religion has two sides. The outer side consists in the impious worship of the images and in many fables, 
chants that lead people to worship of superstitious idols and to committing of countless sins. The second, an inner side, is much worse because it is atheism and lets loose all kinds of sin. This is poison. Just as we would cause every branch and leaf to fall when we felled the old and dangerous tree itself, so after we overthrow this black liar, that is, Buddha, all the legends about the idols that he created would then crumble by themselves. The Vietnamese network of Mandarin education was also attacked. Under this private system, literacy had been very high, even among peasants. But these schools taught Confucian values, not French ones. And classes were conducted in Vietnamese, not French. The Mandarin system was, therefore, dismantled. French became the official language, with all legal and governmental affairs conducted in French. Since the only Vietnamese who knew French were the missionary taught Catholics, this group acquired an immense influence. Corruption ran rampant. The peasant became aware of two oppressors, the French and the Vietnamese who worked for the French. With this awareness, Vietnam's struggle for independence became a social revolution as well. But French domination never extended completely into central and northern Vietnam. Although central Vietnam, called Annam, became a French protectorate, it never felt the full impact of French colonialism. For example, Mandarin education was preserved and resulted in 90% literacy, as opposed to the 50% or less literacy in the south. In the north, called Tonkin, the French presence was barely felt at all. The vast majority of farmers remained private landowners, and the Mandarin school system ensured widespread literacy here as well. Some historians point to the difference in French rule as one key to understanding the different development of North and South Vietnam. The Americans viewed the French in Vietnam as white exploiters who lorded it over the all-good natives. But American hands were not clean of colonialism. The United States had acquired its own interests in the Pacific, the Philippine Islands. But joining what some have called the colonial club did not mellow America's view of French Indochina. Elliot Roosevelt later recalled the words of his father, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, near the end of World War II. The native Indochinese have been so flagrantly downtrodden that they thought to themselves, anything must be better than to live under French colonial rule. Don't think for a moment that Americans would be dying tonight if it had not been for the short-sighted greed of the French, the British, and the Dutch. France might well have replied that the purpose of colonization is not to improve the colony, but to enrich the home country. Bearing the brunt of French colonial policy was the Vietnamese peasant. George Denoncourt, an American combat photographer during the Vietnam War, recorded his impression of these timeless peasants. They were very polite and gracious people. They were bewildered. They did not know what was right. They were at the mercy of whomsoever had power over them at the moment. Their lives were governed by the season, by agriculture, the water buffalo. The simplicity of their lifestyle, the lack of anything material, made their nobility stand out. They went about their business in a kind of holding pattern, while we went about our business all around them. And then something happened which would change colonial policy around the globe. World War I. The colonies saw major European powers being defeated, and this did great damage to the mystique of the white conqueror. Moreover, during World War I, a revolution had not only swept Russia, it had succeeded. The leader of the new Russian, Lenin, called upon nationalist movements in colonies around the world to reject imperialism. Whispers of revolution could be heard. The impact of World War II was equally dramatic. Much of the Pacific fell quickly under the sway of Japan, the empire of the rising sun. 
At first, many Asians viewed the Japanese as liberators who would throw off Western imperialism. Later, most of them realized that they had merely been absorbed by another empire. Japan looked covetously at the rice fields of Vietnam, which could feed her hungry army. On June 25, 1940, a conquered France signed an armistice with the Third Reich. On August 30, 1940, the French Vichy government, a virtual puppet of Germany, signed an accord with Japan, recognizing what she called Japan's preeminent position in the Far East. By this accord, Japan received virtually all of Vietnam's rice, rubber, and mineral exports. France received the right to share sovereignty over Vietnam with Japan. The collaboration in Europe between Vichy France and Germany found its counterpart in Asia in the collaboration between the French colonialists and the Japanese. Japan's presence in Vietnam left America in a sticky situation. America depended on Vietnam for approximately one half of its rubber. This supply ceased. The Allies cut off Japan's supply of oil, hastening Japan's conquest of the rich oil fields of Indonesia. By late 1944, however, the fortunes of war had turned against Japan. American victories in Malaya, Indonesia, and the Philippines had forced the Japanese into a steady retreat. The French in Indochina began to see the wisdom in breaking away from Japan. In turn, Japan saw the wisdom of breaking her treaty with the French. Thousands of French were taken prisoner. Whole regiments surrendered without a shot. Bao Dai, the 13th emperor of Vietnam, called the Playboy Emperor, assumed a puppet leadership of his country. Some French resisted. America's attitude toward these French soldiers was well captured by one example. When the doomed garrison at Lang Son called for air support, General Chenault of the American 14th Air Force responded by planning airdrops. The last message from the French garrison was, Still holding three-fourths of citadel, no water, Request air support and supply drops. Where are the Americans? After the war, Chenault explained his absence. Orders arrived from theater headquarters stating that no arms and ammunition would be provided to French troops under any circumstances. I was allowed to proceed with normal action against the Japanese in Indochina, provided it did not involve supplying French troops. Apparently, it was American policy then that French Indochina would not be returned to the French. The American government was interested in seeing the French forcibly ejected from Indochina, so the problem of post-war separation from their colony would be easier. I carried out my orders to the letter, but I did not relish the idea of leaving Frenchmen to be slaughtered in the jungle while I was forced, officially, to ignore their plight. Only after the last organized French units had been destroyed did President Roosevelt release Chenault's aircraft for support missions in Indochina. On August 6, 1945, America dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. The war in the Pacific was soon over. When the Japanese capitulated in Vietnam, however, they surrendered to the Viet Minh rather than to the Allies. The term Viet Minh is an abbreviation for Vietnam Doc Lap Dong Minh, or League for the Independence of Vietnam. Founded during World War II by Vietnamese refugees in China, the Viet Minh was a broad coalition of Vietnamese who acted against the Japanese during the war. But now the war was over. Ho Chi Minh's guerrillas now seized control of Hanoi and demanded the surrender of the Imperial Seal the symbol of Vietnamese authority. Emperor Bao Dai wisely abdicated. He gave sage counsel to Charles de Gaulle, then president of the provisional government of France. Even though you may be able to re-establish French administration here, it would not be obeyed anymore. Each village would become a resistance nest. Every former collaborator would become an enemy. I beg you to understand that the only way to safeguard French interests and the spiritual influence of France in Indochina is to recognize, frankly, the independence of Vietnam and to renounce all thoughts of re-establishing French sovereignty or administration under any form whatsoever. 
now a private citizen, Bao Dai wisely pledged to support the communist Ho Chi Minh. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam was proclaimed on September 1, 1945. The regime looked hopefully to America for support. After all, the United States had opposed returning Vietnam to France. Moreover, President Roosevelt had profoundly disliked Charles de Gaulle, who had profoundly disliked him back. On March 27, 1943, in a White House conference, the President had suggested establishing a trusteeship for Indochina. This would have blocked the re-establishment of French Indochina. Roosevelt also brought this up at an Allied conference at Yalta, but Churchill vetoed it. The French have a saying, fear of the English is the beginning of wisdom, but in this instance, the English had sided with the French. Britain, a colonial power herself, wanted Vietnam restored to France. A trusteeship was out of the question. Of the trusteeship, Roosevelt later wrote, Stalin liked the idea. China liked the idea. The British don't like it. It might bust up their empire. Roosevelt's death in April of 1945 had ushered Harry S. Truman into the White House. Years later, Richard Nixon, in his book No More Vietnams, described the situation confronting Truman. He faced a dilemma in Vietnam. While he saw the danger of communist conquest in Vietnam, he also opposed colonialism. But Vietnam was a secondary issue for Truman. His primary concern immediately after World War II was to block communist expansion in Europe. He needed French support to achieve that goal. Consequently, he continued to provide aid to France for its fight against communists in Indochina without insisting that the French give their colonies independence. Truman ignored Ho's appeals for support, even when they were accompanied by the lure of an American naval base. With British assistance, the French soon regained control of the city of Saigon and much of the provinces of Annam and Cochin, China. Operating mostly from the northern province of Tonkin, the Viet Minh quickly attempted to legitimize its position in Vietnam through elections for a national assembly. Donald Lancaster, a British officer in Saigon, had the opportunity to observe this process. The elections which were held in Tonkin, Annam, and clandestinely in some parts of Cochin, China, were attended by many irregularities and by some evidence of a readiness to fabricate returns. Nevertheless, the results which gave the Viet Minh a clear majority in the assembly were probably fairly indicative of the state of public opinion at that time. In the northern city of Hanoi, endless negotiations ensued between the Viet Minh, France, and nationalist China, who had acquired an interest in Vietnam through post-war treaties. Eventually, France bribed China into leaving Vietnam. But when the first French vessels entered the northern port of Haiphong at dawn on March 6, 1946, the local Chinese commander opened fire, believing that he had not been informed in a sufficiently official manner. When a French shell exploded 600 tons of Chinese ammunition stored on the docks, the Chinese commander felt that he had now been sufficiently informed. He ceased fire. On March 6, 1946, the Viet Minh signed an agreement with the French which divided the country in two. It recognized the independence of North Vietnam, but left the South under French control. In May, Ho Chi Minh and several other North Vietnamese leaders left for Paris to negotiate the final details of agreement. But France had appointed Admiral Thierry Dargonneau as the first High Commissioner to Indochina, and Dargonneau was, as one of his staff commented, the most brilliant mind of the 12th century. On May 30, 1946, without the knowledge or authorization of Paris, Dargonneau recognized the Republic of Cochin, China. This southern province was recognized on the same basic terms as the Northern Republic of Vietnam. On June 2nd, Cochin, China proclaimed itself a republic. To the Viet Minh, this proclamation was a rank betrayal of the March Agreement. The Paris talks did not proceed well. By November 1946, Ho was back in Hanoi. He announced a new constitution which claimed Cochin, China as North Vietnamese territory. On the following day, the president of Cochin, China committed suicide. 
William C. Bullitt, American ambassador to the French government in exile during World War II, advised the French, If the French government could bring itself to realize that the days of mercantile colonialism are over, it could still preserve all the real interests of France in Vietnam. Instead, the French brought back Emperor Bao Dai to give the fig leaf of respectability to a puppet government. But most of the South Vietnamese people continued to back the anti-French Viet Minh. After World War II, Japanese deserters provided the Viet Minh with the best of military instruction. The Chinese provided them with the best of weaponry, largely captured from Americans in Korea. The Viet Minh became convinced that they could rid themselves of the French. Unfortunately, the French felt equally confident. Bernard Fall, whom some considered to be the foremost commentator on Vietnam, explained the mood of the French. The French forces sent to Indochina were too strong for France to resist the temptation of using them, yet not strong enough to keep the Viet Minh from trying to solve the whole political problem by throwing the French into the sea. The outbreak of the Indochina War can be traced back to that single, tragic, erroneous estimate. The Indochina War exploded with one incident. In 1946, hoping to overthrow Ho Chi Minh, the French cut off the flow of rice to North Vietnam. Famine resulted. To bring relief, the Viet Minh abolished taxes, leaving the government dependent upon customs. Then the French demanded control of customs at the rich northern seaport of Haiphong. On November 20, 1946, 23 French soldiers were killed in Haiphong. The next day, a French burial detail was fired upon and six more men died. Furious, the French gave the Viet Minh two hours to evacuate the city. Then, French ground troops moved in. At the sound of shooting, thousands of unarmed Vietnamese streamed out of their houses toward the open country. A French cruiser, anchored offshore, opened fire. 6,000 Vietnamese were either killed by gunfire or trampled to death. On December 19, 1946, the electric power plant in Hanoi was blown up, plunging the city into darkness. Screaming waves of Vietnamese threw themselves on French military installations and on defenseless French civilians. Within hours, French garrisons throughout Vietnam were under attack by Viet Minh. The Indochina War had begun. Ho Chi Minh, calling Viet Minh a tiger and France an elephant, predicted the war's outcome. If ever the tiger pauses, the elephant will impale him on his mighty tusks. But the tiger will not pause, and the elephant will die of exhaustion and loss of blood. The key figure in the Viet Minh was Ho Chi Minh, a name which means he who enlightens. Accounts of Ho vary widely. Because of the many identities he assumed as a young revolutionary, it is difficult even to establish his birth date. Opinions of the man also differ widely. An American officer who worked closely with Ho for several months called him an awfully sweet guy. A French negotiator called him an intransigent and incorruptible revolutionary. In photographs, Ho Chi Minh can be seen as a lean, unassuming man who wears either the Mao Zedong suit of his party or a dark peasant outfit with rubber sandals. This was part of the image he cultivated, the image of Ho, man of the people. Often he was called Uncle Ho, perhaps because the father image was too closely associated with former Chinese conquerors. The image, however, was deceptive. Ho Chi Minh was not only a scholar, a linguist, and a hardened revolutionary, he was also one of the most astute political players of the 20th century. His father had been a teacher in the Mandarin tradition and an important leader in a revolt against the French. Thus, Ho Chi Minh had been born into revolution. In his essay, The Path Which Led Me to Leninism, Ho spelled out his allegiance. At first, patriotism, not yet communism, led me to have confidence in Lenin, step by step, along the struggle, by studying Marxism-Leninism parallel with participation in practical activities, I gradually came upon the fact that only socialism and communism 
can liberate the oppressed nations and the working people throughout the world from slavery. Despite his commitment to communism, Ho did not lose sight of his overriding goal, Vietnamese independence. Thus, Vietnamese communism was tailored to Vietnamese need. When Ho translated the word socialism, he translated it as protection of traditional values. Moreover, he carefully played the two great communist powers, Russia and China, against each other, thus preventing either from controlling North Vietnam. In particular, he shied away from China, who liked to play an elder brother role in Southeast Asia. Ho Chi Minh realized that China could easily absorb Vietnam as a satellite state, just as it once had absorbed her as a colony. But the French would be defeated by incessant rains and typhoon winds, by heat and disease, as much as by Vietnamese nationalism. The jungle dampness rotted uniforms off soldiers' backs. The monsoons ruined military hardware. Artillery stuck in the mud. Aircraft was grounded by clouds. The Viet Minh, however, knew and used the climate and the terrain of the country. They fought the war on a level that obviated the French technological advantage. Even with American aid, which ultimately paid 80% of the French military expenses, the French could not prevail. Communist Party spokesman Trung Chin explained this new warfare. People's war, not modern weapons and techniques, decides victory because war is the most acute form of struggle between man and man, and not between various kinds of weapons and techniques, which cannot spontaneously oppose one another. Weapons, no matter how keen they may be, can only be handled and used by man. This warfare stressed political indoctrination. Political education in one form or another, films, lectures, inspirational plays, or basic education, reportedly took up almost 50% of training time. Lucien Max Chassin, the former commanding general of the French Far Eastern Air Force, observed, In the day's work of the Red Soldier, the Marxist political lesson plays as important a part as the arms manual. Taken in hand by intelligent leaders, the armed peasant rapidly becomes a fanatic, an apostle of the new religion. The head of the North Vietnamese military was Communist General Vo Nguyen Jap, a stocky, even-tempered man who had once been described as a snow-covered volcano. When the French had cracked down on Vietnamese communists in 1939, Jop had fled to China. His wife was arrested and died in prison in 1943. Their only child died shortly thereafter. Jop became single-mindedly dedicated to communism and Vietnamese independence. He soaked up the teachings of the 13th century strategist Tran Hung Dao on guerrilla warfare. Dao had taught his army to assemble only at the place and time of battle to use feint and strike maneuvers to ambush the enemy and to harass enemy supply lines. Jop's troops used their knowledge of local terrain to establish inaccessible hideouts, weapon caches, and bases. Although he had no formal military training, in civilian life he was a history teacher. Jop demonstrated military brilliance first against the French, then against the Americans. One aspect of Jop's success was his ruthless attitude. During the Indochina War, Jop once remarked, Every minute, hundreds of thousands of people die all over the world. The life or death of thousands of human beings, even if they are our compatriots, represents really very little. But to many, resistance was more of a romantic act. Appeals to nationalism and rhetoric against the foreign devil gave a heroic glow to guerrilla warfare. This glow showed up in Vietnamese literature, such as the 1948 poem entitled Road Sabotage. The cold moves from Thai Nguyen down to Yên Thế, and the wind rages through the woods and the care pass. But I am a woman from Bắc Giang who does not feel the cold, who feels nothing but the land, the land. At home we have yet to dry the paddy and stalk the corn and chop the manioc. At home we have quite a few children. Still, 
I follow my husband to sabotage the road. Lullaby, my child, sleep well and wait. When the moon fades, I will return. The death blow for France in the Indochina War came at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Here the Viet Minh demonstrated that a revolutionary force could defeat a conventional army in open battle. Of course, being well equipped helped. In November 1950, China had invaded Korea in response to American troops moving toward the Chinese border. In the resulting campaign, the Chinese had captured huge amounts of American weaponry. Since the equipment was incompatible with their own Russian weaponry, the Chinese turned this stockpile over to North Vietnam. The Viet Minh replenished themselves by capturing whatever was needed from the American-supplied French. As one Chinese soldier remarked, the Americans are the greatest quartermasters in the world. Dien Bien Phu is a valley in North Vietnam near the Laotian border. Occupied by the French, it was surrounded and bombarded by the Viet Minh, who occupied the hills. Roads had been hacked through 300 miles of jungle by thousands of slave laborers in order to supply the North Vietnamese with tons of ammunition and food every day. Dien Bien Phu was under siege. After 55 days of fighting on May 7, 1954, the flag of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam was planted on the headquarters bunker of Dien Bien Phu. France wanted out of Vietnam. Although America wanted them to fight to the last Frenchman, the French were tired. Perhaps America would have intervened had President Eisenhower not been elected less than two years before on a platform that promised to end the Korean War. A new era in Asian warfare had arrived, an era to which Western tactics were not adapted. By the end of the Indochina War, the Communists had probably lost more than a half a million men. The French had lost 172,000. With the capture of Dien Bien Phu, a war had ended, but peace would not come to Indochina. America had become a major player in Vietnam. After World War II, the United States had been somewhat apathetic about Indochina. Japan had collapsed so quickly after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that the West was somewhat unprepared to design an Asian policy. Moreover, the death of Roosevelt on April 12, 1945, stunned the nation. President Truman was abruptly left to chart post-war planning. The world that faced Truman was different than Roosevelt's world. It seemed to verge on revolution and communism. Russia had swollen in size and influence. China was now a people's republic under the leadership of Mao Zedong. Cardinal Spellman, one of America's most powerful voices, cried out against this new world. Communism has a world plan, and it has been following a carefully set up timetable for the achievement of that plan. Americans must not be lulled into sleep by indifference, nor be beguiled by the prospect of peaceful coexistence with communists. How can there be peaceful coexistence between two parties if one of them is continually clawing at the throat of the other? Do you peacefully coexist with men who thus would train the youth of their godless red world? American aid to France during the Indochina War was a direct reflection of America's fear of communist China. In 1949, the American-backed government in China had collapsed. As the communist army of Mao Zedong advanced southward, it raised the possibility of Chinese collaboration with the Viet Minh. After all, the Chinese had come to the aid of the North Koreans during the Korean War. The French began to court American aid. The Americans began to show interest. In 1949, Communist China sent a delegate to New York to assume a seat in the United Nations. America was appalled, but international opinion favored the seating of the Chinese delegate. America, therefore, struck an agreement with France. In return for France's support in blocking Chinese entry into the UN, the United States would financially support French forces in Vietnam against the Viet Minh. Since World War II, American policy had been directed against communism. President Truman had initiated a foreign policy involving military, political, and economic programs throughout the world. Known as the Truman Doctrine, this foreign policy was a key to the Cold War. 
Some historians have described the Cold War as a period of peace in which wartime measures have been pursued. It has been seen as a period of global conflict, sometimes subtly expressed, through which Russia and America each have attempted to dominate the balance of power. America identified communism with subversion of Western society, and American policymakers began to stress three points. First, a unilateral American approach to matters of vital concern. Second, the containment of communism. And third, the domino theory. Years later, Senator George McGovern would examine the domino theory in relation to Vietnam. The historical rationalization of our Vietnam intervention is based on the Munich analogy or the domino theory. At Munich in 1938, the Western Allies failed to stand up to Hitler's demand for a peace of Czechoslovakia. The result of this surrender was a series of aggressions leading to World War II. In Vietnam, so the theory goes, we are faced with another Hitler in the form of Ho Chi Minh. As for falling dominoes in Asia, it is clear that the challenge is not a Hitler or a Ho from the outside, but their own domestic, political, economic, and social problems. A country that builds a government responsive to the needs of the citizenry, that faces up to the internal problems of misrule, injustice, and human misery need have little fear of falling victim to a war of liberation. The center of the Cold War began to shift from Europe to the emerging nations of Asia and Africa. The rise of communist China and Russia's successful test of a nuclear device panicked America. Rebellion in Burma, Malaya, and Indonesia seemed to finger Southeast Asia as the next domino in the chain. What would this do to American security in the Pacific? How would it affect American access to Asian markets? Southeast Asia was the world's largest producer of rubber. When the Korean conflict began in 1950, America did three things. First, it ordered American air and naval forces to support South Korea's military. Second, an American fleet interposed itself between Korea and mainland China to prevent an attack. Third, the United States established a military aid and assistance group in Hanoi to coordinate the funneling of supplies to the French in Vietnam. Thus, even before American troops were in Korea, America was involved in Vietnam. In May of 1950, Secretary of State Dean Acheson met with officials in Paris and issued a statement. The French Foreign Minister and I have just had an exchange of views on the situation in Indochina and are in general agreement both as to the urgency of the situation and as to the necessity for remedial action. The United States government, convinced that neither national independence nor democratic evolution exists in any area dominated by Soviet imperialism, considers the situation to be such as to warrant its according economic aid and military equipment to the associated states of Indochina and to France. The Korean War confirmed America's worst fears about communism. As Chinese soldiers swarmed down from communist China, the proud General MacArthur was driven into retreat. The Korean conflict quickly became a frustrating and unpopular war. All in all, Americans seemed relieved it was over. One critic of the war was Ohio Senator Robert A. Taft, Taft was acutely aware of the connection between domestic and foreign policy. He believed that war squanders economic and human resources, centralizes dangerous power in the hands of the government, and severely limits individual liberty. According to Taft, many states, Tsarist Russia among them, had never recovered from the crises produced by war. Moreover, Taft believed that if America slipped into imperialism, it would undercut her moral leadership in the world. In 1949, Taft had warned. It is easy to slip into an attitude of imperialism and to entertain the idea that we know what is good for other people better than they know themselves. 
From there, it is an easy step to the point where war becomes an instrument of public policy rather than the last resort to maintain our liberty. In essence, Taft believed that the struggle against communism was ideological, not military. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, however, accepted the Southeast Asian policy bequeathed to him by Truman. Both Eisenhower and his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, saw Ho Chi Minh as a communist Hitler. Perhaps more importantly, they saw Vietnam as the key to Southeast Asia. If Vietnam fell, other Asian nations would follow. Historian David Schoenbrunn would later write, Our predicament began with the judgment of John Foster Dulles, a correct judgment, that Ho Chi Minh had become so popular a national hero that he would win free elections by a big margin. It was not the judgment that was wrong, but the conclusion Dulles drew from it. Dulles decided that we must organize an Asian equivalent to NATO and stall off free elections. This policy was based on America's brilliant success in Europe. The error, of course, was the assumption that a policy which had worked in industrialized, technologically advanced, white Christian Europe could also work in rural, backward, yellow, non-Christian Asia. But Eisenhower was a military man who almost instinctively opposed sending American ground troops into Vietnam to support France. The conflict in Korea had ended badly for America and the United States was weary of war. Besides, Eisenhower was not confident that the French could win in Vietnam. Thus, although America picked up much of the check, she refused to be drawn further into the Indochina War. But in the background, a young Vietnamese named No Din Zim was in America lobbying for support. Among the American leaders he deeply impressed was Senator and future President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. John F. Kennedy had been distressed by the communist takeover of China. In 1949, he had addressed the House. Mr. Speaker, over this weekend, we have learned the extent of the disaster that has befallen China and the United States. The responsibility for the failure of our foreign policy in the Far East rests squarely with the White House and the Department of State. Our policy of vacillation uncertainty and confusion has reaped the whirlwind. This House must now assume the responsibility of preventing the onrushing tide of communism from engulfing all of Asia. Kennedy would carry this conviction with him into the White House. In 1954, the Indochina War ended at a conference table in Geneva. The conference opened with the news of the fall of Dien Bien Phu. The magazine U.S. News and World Report grumbled, The non-communist white man, in a word, seems to be through in Asia. It's up to the non-communist Asians now. The American Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, refused to shake hands with his Chinese counterpart, Zhou Enlai. Dulles withdrew from the conference, leaving his undersecretary, Walter Bedell Smith, to lead the United States delegation. Much has been written about the signing or non-signing of the Geneva Accords. Certainly, the United States and South Vietnam would later claim the agreement was not binding because they had not signed it. On July 23, 1954, John Foster Dulles informed a news conference, Since the United States itself was neither a belligerent in Indochina, nor subject to compulsions which applied to others, we did not become a party to the conference results. We merely noted them and said that, in accordance with the United Nations Charter, we would not seek by force to overthrow the settlement. The important thing for now, it is not to mourn the past, but to seize the future opportunity to prevent the loss in northern Vietnam from leading to the extension of communism throughout Southeast Asia. In essence, the settlement at Geneva did three things. First, it ended the war. Second, it divided Vietnam in half, 
ostensibly on a temporary basis, and third, it set up an apparatus for a national Vietnamese election in July of 1956 in order to unite the nation. The Geneva Accords were signed by the representatives of the Viet Minh and the French, the two real contestants in Vietnam. The basic agreement was noted by the full nine-nation meeting. The Geneva Accords received a mixed reception in America. Republican Senate leader William Noland denounced it as the greatest victory the Communists have won in 20 years. The Eisenhower administration protected itself by refusing to directly associate with the Accords. The agreement did, however, give America time to build non-communist forces in South Vietnam. The Geneva Accords divided Vietnam along the Ben Hai River, which ran near the 17th parallel. At this point of division, the country was only 39 miles wide. The French sphere of influence was south of the parallel. This area was once again ruled by the puppet emperor Bao Dai from the southern capital of Saigon. The Viet Minh sphere of influence was north of the 17th parallel. Ho Chi Minh assumed leadership from the northern capital of Hanoi. The 17th parallel represented a fairly accurate dividing line between where the Vietnamese communists had won and where they had lost. Largely because of the well-organized and semi-military religious sects in the south, communists had never established a foothold there. Moreover, communists in the South had never learned the fine art of working with and absorbing other organizations. The United States, however, believed that South Vietnam was on the brink of falling into communism. Sealing Vietnam off into two regions had many consequences, including separating families and creating food shortages. On a political level, each zone became dependent on foreign aid rather than upon each other. The North depended on Russian and Chinese aid. The South depended on America. Slowly, each zone began to develop a distinct identity. Part of the Southern identity was a feeling of inferiority. Its regime had fought beside the French in the Indochina War and had shared the French defeat. The Viet Minh, not the South, had fought for Vietnamese independence. Now each of the two governments tried to win the allegiance of the Vietnamese people. Propaganda on each side stressed how awful the other zone would be when the Geneva Accords deadline for dividing Vietnam finally elapsed. The South predicted religious intolerance and poverty in the North. The North predicted political reprisals in the South. The militant attitude of the two Vietnams was captured in the national anthem of the Republic of Vietnam, that is, the anthem of South Vietnam. People of Vietnam, this is the time we must liberate our country. Let's all march forward and, if need be, repay our nation with our life. For the future of our country, let us run into the smokes of battles so that our beloved Vietnam will forever remain free and secure, even if we should perish on the battlefield. By the terms of the Geneva Accords, civilians were given until 1956 to cross the 17th parallel to the side of their choice. Approximately 100,000 Viet Minh sympathizers went north. However, this number may have been held down by order of the Viet Minh who wanted their sympathizers to stay in the south, both to propagandize and to vote in the upcoming election. William Henderson publicly speculated about this strategy in the influential periodical Foreign Affairs. The exact strength of the Communists in South Vietnam is a matter of speculation. After May 18, 1955, the date on which all Viet Minh forces were supposedly withdrawn from the South, the Communists continued to exercise effective political authority in many rural areas. They had extensively infiltrated the government apparatus, the police, and the armed forces. And they enjoyed considerable support, or at least acquiescence, among large segments of the rural population. As the Viet Minh moved north, approximately 875,000 people, mostly Catholics, went south. This migration was heralded by American planes dropping leaflets which proclaimed, The Virgin Mary is moving south. Many Catholics came in the belief that they would be given land, which was in short supply in the northern Red River Delta. 
Usually, the refugees moved as whole villages, with their institutions and leadership intact. Ironically, this exodus made life in the north somewhat easier. The migration removed a rebellious population and left desirable land which could be redistributed without upheaval. American propaganda made the most of the exodus. A former Navy doctor, Tom Dooley, wrote a poignant book entitled Deliver Us From Evil, which chronicled in detail, if not in accuracy, the plight of the Catholic refugees. On January 25, 1955, Look magazine carried an impressive photo story. The article's subheading read, Battered and shunted about by war, they are too weary to resist the Reds without us. The article stated, Asians are convinced that U.S. prestige and influence in Asia cannot survive another defeat. Europe wants to see whether the communists will be stopped here or will grow into an irresistible force. No more than 18 months remain for us to complete the job of winning over the Vietnamese before they vote. What can we do? To some American policymakers, the answer to Vietnam's problems was clear. The answer was no Den Xiem. After the Geneva Accords were signed, the playboy emperor Bao Dai went to France and left Prime Minister No Den Xiem to manage South Vietnam. Of this absentee ruler, the New York Times proclaimed, There can be no pretense of political respectability in South Vietnam until the moral deadweight of Bao Dai, so-called emperor and chief of state, is shed. Bao Dai rests on democracy's conscience, about as comfortably as the putrefying albatross around the neck of Coleridge's ancient mariner. Jim, on the other hand, basked in American support. America abruptly halted a revolt of the South Vietnamese army by making it clear that the United States would not pay the army if Jim was overthrown. Secure in his power, Jim announced a nationwide referendum on the issue of monarchy versus republic. In other words, Bao Dai versus Jim. Jim won this referendum by a vote of 98.2% in favor and 1.1% against. In this remarkable election, 605,000 votes were cast in the Saigon Cholon area alone, even though it held only 450,000 registered voters. But the election gave the aura of legitimacy to Ziem, who became chief of state on October 26, 1955. This position gave Ziem complete civilian and military power. The French had never been enthusiastic about Ziem, and he reciprocated. The depth of Ziem's distaste for everything French can be judged by a presidential decree of August 30th, 1956, which abolished all French first names for Vietnamese nationals. But Jim admired America. During his lobbying campaign in the United States, Jim had enlisted the support of such prominent opinion makers as Cardinal Spellman, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, Senator John F. Kennedy, and Arthur J. Schlesinger. In this McCarthy period of communist paranoia, Jim's anti-communist credentials stood him in good stead. Those who considered Vietnam to be a showcase of democracy now formed an unofficial Vietnam lobby. A group called the American Friends of Vietnam was founded in the fall of 1955, providing this powerful lobby with a formal organization. Its political objective was to persuade the United States to commit massive aid to Ziem. American money had financed the French side of the Indochina War. It would now finance the regime that the French would leave behind. The United States, it was said, could not afford another defeat in Asia. Accordingly, America tried to apply Western democracy onto an Oriental face. As a European journalist observed, The Americans go about their business in dead earnest. Having decided to transplant their variety of democracy into this forgotten corner of Asia, they rejoice in every gesture of democracy as only a mother could rejoice in the progress of her child. The greater majority of Americans in Vietnam very sincerely believe that in transplanting their institutions, they will immunize South Vietnam against communist propaganda. Jim, an anti-communist steeped in Western ways, rode the crest of American hopes. But who was Jim, labeled the miracle man of Vietnam? 
an American observer describes him's appearance. He was a short, broadly built man with a round face and a shock of black hair who walked and moved jerkily as if on strings. He was always dressed in white and looked as if he were made out of ivory. In contrast to Ho Chi Minh's peasant attire, Jem appeared either in traditional Mandarin dress or in the snow-white business suit of the French colonial tradition. Vietnam commentator Bernard Fall offered a glimpse into the inner Jem, a man who was known as a devout Catholic. His faith is made less of the kindness of the apostles than of the ruthless militancy of the Grand Inquisitor. And his view of government is made less of the constitutional strength of a president of the republic than of the petty tyranny of a tradition-bound Mandarin. To a French Catholic interlocutor who wanted to emphasize Diem's bonds with French culture by stressing our common faith, Diem was reported to have answered calmly, you know, I consider myself rather as a Spanish Catholic, that is, a spiritual son of a fiercely aggressive and militant faith, rather than of the easygoing and tolerant approach of Gallican Catholicism. In essence, democracy was lost on Zim. He advocated a political philosophy called personalism, a potpourri of right-wing Catholicism and anti-communism. In theory, personalism was supposed to emphasize human dignity, in contrast to the communist view of man as a mere subcomponent of the masses. In practice, it became a rationale for absolute state power. Madame Nu, Zem's sister-in-law, expounded on the philosophy of personalism. Our oneness will never be a disorderly collection of individuals who pull themselves in different directions for only one purpose, that of individual self-interest. Our union, drawing its strength from unity and discipline, will track down, neutralize, and extirpate all of the society's scabby sheep, enemies of this personalist regime which pledges to bring forth solutions to the problems of an underdeveloped country and to ensure independence, liberty, and happiness to all. To please his American observers, Jem gave a nod to democracy, but reserved power to himself and to his family, three of his brothers being appointed to a six-man cabinet. One of his brothers rose to particular influence and notoriety. No Din Nu became Jem's chief political advisor. Having received a pledge of support from President Eisenhower, Jem appealed to America for aid in consolidating his regime. Money and advisors poured in. Perhaps the most influential group of observers were the social scientists sent over by Michigan State University. In the spring of 1955, Vice President Nixon had called the president of Michigan State University, declaring Vietnam to be a top priority. The university became convinced that national interest demanded its involvement. Thus, a group of social scientists were paid by the United States to advise the Vietnamese government. One of their duties was to orchestrate the formation of a secret police force under the control of No Den Nu, Jem's brother. But Jem himself required a strong police force. The November 1955 monthly report of the professors stated, During the month of October, we received a notice of Washington's approval of the recommended expanded police program submitted August 29th. We started immediately to implement this program. Conferences were held trying to coordinate internal security operations in Vietnam in which our government has an interest. Using the American FBI as a model, a Vietnamese Bureau of Investigation was created with the Vietnamese Bureau controlling the flow of information and mail. To pacify the countryside, a civil guard was organized. Americans also trained immigration authorities to fingerprint the Vietnamese Chinese population who were distrusted by Jem. All government agencies were trained to maintain security dossiers. Against this backdrop, 
The South Vietnamese Constitution was proclaimed on October 26, 1956. Although it borrowed from the American Constitution, it laid heavy emphasis on a strong executive. It gave a nod to individual rights, but these rights received little real protection. For example, official censorship over Vietnamese-owned newspapers was discontinued, but several newspapers were unofficially wrecked. Two newspapers were sued for libel by government agencies. One police report on a publisher named Tu described a discussion between Tu and President Diem. The president reproaches Mr. Tu with having written that persons had been arrested and their trace never found. He invites him to cite names. Mr. Tu seems embarrassed, but as he is pressed by the president, he replies, the dog Fu has been arrested a few days ago, and there are other names which I would not like to cite. But here is a letter which may be illuminating. Mr. Tu hands a letter to the president, who reads it and no longer insists. The rights of minorities also slipped between the lines of the 1956 Constitution. For example, the half million or so Cambodians living in the Mekong Delta were forced to change their names to Vietnamese equivalents. They were prohibited from various religious and cultural practices. The most important minority in Vietnam consisted of the mountain people or Montagnards. Jem's official policy toward the Montagnards was equality with the lowland Vietnamese and integration into them. But equality meant the right of lowlanders to colonize tribal areas. Integration meant the loss of tribal schools and tribal identity. In contrast, the North Vietnamese infiltrated these tribes with propagandists who not only spoke the language, but who went so far as to break their own front teeth in order to conform with local mores. As the Catholic Zem consolidated his power, he ran up against the Buddhist majority of South Vietnam. The two most important religious groups opposing Diem were the Wa Hao and the Cao Dai. The Wa Hao was a reformed Buddhist sect, and the Cao Dai was a sect which combined Confucianism, Buddhism, and Roman Catholicism. These sects maintained their own armies and had formed a solid barrier against communism in the South for years. During the Indochina War, the French had deployed relatively few troops in South Vietnam because they knew they could rely upon the anti-communist vigil of these sects. But these religious armies were a threat to the ambitious and Catholic Zim. Early in his reign, Zim managed to alienate these sects along with virtually every other anti-communist group. One source of this alienation was Jem's preferential treatment of Catholics. The Catholic refugees from the north had been resettled into desirable areas, mostly around Saigon and along major roads. These Catholics became Jem's base of support. They provided the cheering crowds that convinced American visitors of Jem's popularity. Much of the Catholic resettlement, however, had been conducted on land confiscated from Buddhists. Religious tension soared, nudged along by privileges granted by Zem to the Catholics. For example, in a predominantly Buddhist country, the army contained only Catholic chaplains. The scholarly Nguyen Van Trung of Saigon University wrote sadly of how his fellow Vietnamese Catholics were becoming foreign oppressors in their own land. A number of foreign missionaries misconceived their role and created among their converts a colonial mentality and a negative attitude towards their own civilization. Thus, our form of worship, our art, our religious practices have turned us into strangers among the non-Catholic population. The Roman Catholic Church in Vietnam has become a distinct community, isolated and close to the other communities in the nation because when a Vietnamese converts, he not only has to abandon his traditional religion and ancestor worship, but also to relinquish his native cultural heritage with which he may assert his Vietnamese identity, all in order to accept a new way of thinking and living and a new set of alien customs. In the end, 
the Catholics had to live as foreigners amid their countrymen. Zem's power base in Saigon was under attack. The Wahau claimed as many as one million followers and with an army of 15,000, they dominated the Mekong Delta. The Khao Dai claimed two million followers with an army of 20,000. They controlled much of the area north of Saigon. Despite their armies, these sects were first and foremost commercial groups, active as traders and merchants. Thus, they controlled much of the economy as well. Joining the fray were the Ben Shuin. The Ben Shuin were an organized crime group, which had an army of 25,000 men. With the approval of Bao Dai and the French, they had run Saigon's police force. Ben Shuen troops had occupied most of the roads leading out of Saigon, where they levied so-called safety taxes on cars and buses and on small farmers bringing their produce to market. The French had left these factions alone. Zem would not. The Vietnamese scholar and poet Thich Nhat Han observed, Various groups in South Vietnam sought to participate in the government in the hope of making it a genuinely representative one. Such groups as the Khao Dai and the Hua Hao, who had their own armies, used these as a base from which to seek participation in the government. However, Diem and his American advisors chose instead to suppress all these groups forcibly, maintaining that a state could not exist within a state. The Diem government became obsessed with eliminating all opposition, but gave no thought to their consolidation of the various non-communist forces in South Vietnam. On March 31, 1956, the Ben Shuen shelled Zem's palace with mortar fire. A brief but bloody civil war gripped South Vietnam. By the middle of May, however, the Ben Shuen had been pushed back into the swamps. Flushed by victory, Zem's army advanced into the Mekong Rice Bowl, an area held by the Wa Hao. By June, all organized resistance throughout South Vietnam had ceased. The armed remnants of the sects were reduced to carrying on harassment operations. But there was another threat to Zem's regime. The Geneva Accords had called for a national election to be held by July of 1956 in order to unite the two Vietnams. Ho Chi Minh was the clear favorite to win. In July of 1955, Zem had tested the air regarding the elections. Zem spoke for the national or southern government. The national government has emphasized time and time again the price it has paid for the defense of the unity of the country and of true democracy. We did not sign the Geneva Agreements. We are not bound in any way by these agreements, signed against the will of the Vietnamese people. Although elections constitute one of the bases of true democracy, they will be meaningful only on the condition that they are absolutely free. We remain skeptical concerning the possibility of fulfilling the conditions of free elections in the North. But Zem himself had upset the electoral stability of Vietnam. The law of the emperor ends at the village gate. This old Vietnamese saying expresses the delicate balance that had existed between central authority and the autonomy of the villages. Zem destroyed this balance by abolishing the elected village councils and mayors. In their place, he installed his own leaders and tax collectors, thus imposing his rule directly on the Vietnamese peasantry. For Bernard Fall, this was Zem's biggest mistake. When Diem ended 400 to 500 years of the tradition of the democratic election of village chiefs by each village, he made, to my mind, probably his crucial mistake. He began making local appointments from Saigon, and the appointees were met with open hostility by the villagers. The hard fact is that when the Viet Cong assassinated these men, the Viet Cong were given a Robin Hood halo by the villagers. 
When the villagers beheaded his tax collectors, Ziem was able to point to these acts as evidence of spreading communism. To counter this communist threat, Ziem explained, it was necessary to send troops into the villages. Thus, Ziem not only destroyed village democracy, but also convinced America that he was really destroying communism. The poor communications between the two countries had left America dependent upon official Vietnamese reports. Next, with the open encouragement of America, Ziem defied the July 1956 deadline for a national election. This signaled the beginning of a struggle to the death with Hanoi. Up until then, the North had waited to see if Ho Chi Minh could be voted into power. The Communists had violated various terms of the Geneva Accords, but they had not openly confronted the South. Now, Ziem openly confronted them. Although the Geneva Accords prohibited reprisals against former resistance members, the Ziem regime cracked down on Viet Minh still in the South. Between 1955 and 1959, perhaps as many as 75,000 people were executed in South Vietnam as communists or communist sympathizers. Many of them were neither. William Henderson, in Foreign Affairs magazine, pointed out. As the Diem regime waxed in strength and confidence, it gave increasing attention to rooting out the communist danger. All the techniques of political and psychological warfare as well as pacification campaigns involving extensive military operations have been brought to bear against the underground. Some of the methods employed, such as anti-communist denunciation rallies and self-criticism meetings, smack of practices which the communists themselves perfected long ago. And it is clear that the usual democratic safeguards have not always been upheld. Ziem's Presidential Ordinance No. 6 of 1956 indefinitely detained in concentration camps anyone found to be a danger to the state. The ordinance and other repressive acts hit hardest at non-communists who tended to be more visible and more easily apprehended than communists. In an interview with French author Jean Le Couture, No Dinu commented on such harsh measures. In political action, one is occasionally forced to dirty one's hands. There is a difference between what one wants to do and what one does. Restore freedom, give free speech to the opposition, create conditions of coexistence with communism. First of all, you do not coexist with those who want to exterminate you. Moreover, the opposition is not so badly treated by us it cannot speak up. Wait a minute. We do not permit ourselves to be incited or destroyed. Ironically, Ziem further contributed to the popularity of communism through his land reform policies. By the end of the Indochina War in 1954, the powerful Viet Minh had distributed the property of many landowners without compensation. When Ziem consolidated his power in the South, the landlords wanted their property back. Ziem consulted an American expert, Wolf Leginsky, who produced a new land reform program. On the surface, it seemed liberal. For example, it limited land ownership to 245 acres. Former landowners received compensation for land confiscated by the Viet Minh. Rents were reduced. But from the peasants' point of view, Ziem was reducing rents that the Viet Minh had abolished. Ziem was selling land that the Viet Minh had given away. Moreover, as a reward for their loyalty, Catholic refugees were given the most desirable and secure land, even if the land belonged to someone else. Ziem's land policy did more to further communism than any northern propaganda. In his book, Vietnam, Lotus in a Sea of Fire, did not Han wrote, The essence is this. The American effort could succeed if it could detach nationalism from communism. But the Americans cannot do this, just as the French could not do it in their turn. What they do instead is to force these two elements closer together, 
By supporting elements with which the Vietnamese patriots do not identify, they let the whole power of nationalism slip from their hands and into the hands of the communists. In evaluating the political scene, Vietnam observer David Hottam agreed. The chief hope of defending the South from communism was that somebody should succeed in uniting all the genuinely anti-communist nationalist elements into a regime which would have the confidence of the southern people. Had that been done, the bastion would have been strong. But this is precisely what has not been done. Instead of uniting it, Gim has divided the South. Instead of merely crushing his legitimate enemies, the communists, he has crushed all opposition of every kind, however anti-communist it might be. In so doing, he has destroyed the very basis on which his regime should be founded. He has been able to do this simply and solely because of the massive dollar aid he has had from across the Pacific, which kept in power a man who by all the laws of human and political affairs would long ago have fallen. Dim's main supporters are to be found in North America, not in free Vietnam. This is an unnatural situation, and unnatural situations do not last long. We hope you have enjoyed this first of three cassettes on the Vietnam War by Knowledge Products. The script for this presentation is by Wendy McElroy, produced by Pat Childs. Vocal characterizations are by Dan Church, Pat Childs, Rob Daniel, An Dao, Jim Gossett, Han Nguyen, San Nguyen, Travis Hardison, Cecil Jones, Joe Keenan, Bill Kolke, Michael Mint, Nguyen Mint, To Lin Phan, John Sherberg, Norm Woodell, and Robert Nguyen. Music is by Ralph Childs. Recorded at the Village Recorder and Archer Productions. This material may not be copied in whole or in part without the written permission of the copyright owner. Copyright 1990 by Carmichael and Carmichael Incorporated. This presentation of the Vietnam War is a part of the Audio Classics series, a continuing series presenting the major ideas of great thinkers with the discussion of their historical and intellectual context. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.